Thanks. Uh, I also do bar mitzvahs. Um, thanks, Chovav. Um, so let me start by talking about classical fully homomorphic encryption. So uh, in this case, we have a weak, one, a weak uh, client that wants to use the computational power of a strong server to compute some function. So the client has input x, and it wants to get f of x. And the restriction is that we don't want the server to learn anything about the input x. And the way this is done with fully homomorphic encryption is that the client generates a pair of keys, a secret key and a public key, and just encrypts its input using the, using the public key. And our security requirement is just standard semantic security, just like any other encryption scheme. But with the fully homomorphic encryption, the server can perform homomorphic evaluation on, on ciphertext and get from encryption of x to an encryption of f of x. Now, this doesn't have to look like a fresh encryption of f of x, but it needs to decrypt to the right value. And of course, we require this notion of compactness, which means that the length of this encryption of f of x and the time that it takes to decrypt it should be independent of the complexity of the function f itself. Another property that is uh, not always required, but is actually going to be important for this talk, is called circuit privacy. And for our purposes, circuit privacy just means that this encryption of f of x really does need to look like a fresh encryption of f of x. And this should hold even for a computationally unbounded distinguisher. So this is circuit privacy, and homomorphic encryption schemes, uh, classical, have been uh, constructed based on the hardness of the learning with errors problem. And since this problem is considered uh, to be intractable even from quantum computers, this gives you a plausible post-quantum candidate uh, for fully homomorphic encryption. So post-quantum means that the, um, um, the actual users of the scheme are classical, but the adversary might be quantum. So quantum fully homomorphic encryption was presented by Broadband and Jeffrey. And there, you want to uh, outsource a quantum computation. So the server has quantum powers, and you want it to quantumly uh, evaluate um, uh, a function on encrypted, on encrypted ciphertext. Now, we want to allow the client to be either classical or quantum, whatever it wants. So for, the, uh, for that purpose, we need the key generation and the keys to be classical so that the classical client can use them as well. And we also need the property that when we encrypt a classical message, we actually get a classical ciphertext. So this can be done by classical, um, by classical client. But if the client is quantum and it wants to encrypt a quantum message, then it should be able to do that as, that as well. So we want to be able to encrypt quantum messages uh, in such a way that it can degenerate to classical in, in a straightforward way. So uh, this is what we want. And Broadband and Jeffrey don't, didn't only, only present uh, the, the concept, but also presented an approach on how to achieve it. It essentially uses hybrid encryption. So they propose to combine classical fully homomorphic encryption with the quantum one-time pad to get a quantum fully homomorphic encryption. And this approach was used by all previous works and also by, by the work that I'm going to talk about today. Um, however, it seems pretty hard to actually apply this approach to actually get the full-fledged definition. And in fact, the only prior works that achieves the definition that I described is the very recent work of Mahadev. Um, and she constructed the scheme based on the hardness of the learning with errors problem, so similarly to the classical schemes, but with a super polynomial uh, modulus Q. So the modulus is a parameter of the learning with errors problem. And the smaller the modulus get, uh, the harder the problem becomes. So the assumption becomes more favorable or weaker. Um, so originally, Regev proposed the hardness of LWE with polynomial modulus. But as far as we know, super polynomial should also be hard. So this is an assumption that we're OK uh, to rely on. Um, the reason why uh, super polynomial modulus was needed was because this quantum homomorphic evaluation actually had correctness error. And the correctness error scaled more or less with the size of the uh, quantum function that you wanted to evaluate divided by the modulus. So if you want a scheme that works for every, um, for every uh, um, polynomial size function, then you want the super polynomial modulus so that uh, the correctness error uh, remains small. Um, so additionally, if you want the strongest notion of, of fully homomorphic encryption, you need an additional assumption. And this holds even in the classical setting. So even in the classical setting for the strongest uh, possible uh, notion of homomorphism, uh, you actually need uh, what's called a circular security assumption. And this is needed even in Mahadev's quantum scheme. Uh, but actually, uh, she needed a new circular security assumption, uh, which seems stronger than the assumptions that were used in, in, for classical schemes. However, this is like, pretty amazing that this can be done, uh, that this uh, definition can be achieved. Um, but let's be greedy and ask, you know, now that we know that it's possible, why, why can't it be as good as classical uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme? So let's, let's do the comparison here. So in terms of, of the modulus, for classical schemes, we know how to get it from polynomial, for LWE with the polynomial modulus. Um, in terms of circular security, you need a weaker flavor of circular security assumption, or seemingly weaker at least. And for correctness error, actually in the classical setting, uh, you can get schemes with perfect correctness. So there's no correctness error at all. What we do here is get close to achieving the, the uh, to getting to the uh, classical setting. So it all sort of boils down, or most of it boils down to the, to the correctness error. So instead of getting correctness error that is size of function divided by modulus, we get size of function divided by two to the modulus, which allows us to use a polynomial modulus to get an exponentially small correctness error. 
And this allows us to um, use LWE with just polynomial modulus, um, which is slightly larger than the modulus that you need for, uh, for the classical setting, but it's still polynomial. Um, in terms of the circular security assumption, we don't get the same assumption as in the classical setting, but we're actually getting an assumption that appeared in the literature before, and perhaps surprisingly, it appeared in the context of multi-key fully homomorphic encryption. So this is the same assumption that you need in order to get the strongest flavor of multi-key classical fully homomorphic encryption. So this is an assumption that already appeared in the literature. But perhaps um, as important as the uh, specific contributions here, uh, we have sort of a, a conceptual approach to the problem uh, that connects uh, a quantum homomorphism with this, circular, uh, this circuit privacy notion that I was mentioning before, um, and this sheds new light even on previous works. So let me, tell you a bit of, <clears throat> let me tell you a little bit about it, but first let's do a little primer about uh, qubits and quantum registers. So a quantum register is a register that can be in superposition between a few classical states, and if these two states are just zero and one, then we call it a qubit. In terms of notation, we use this Dirac notation, which presents uh, um, a quantum state as uh, um, a linear combination, a linear combination of, of uh, classical states, where these coefficients, w0 and w1, are related to the probability of measuring the value 0 or 1 when you measure this quantum register. Um, in particular, if you measure the register, then the probability of getting 0 uh, is the amplitude square of w0. And this means that the sum of squares of, of all the amplitudes should, should be 1. So when you measure a quantum register, you actually collapse its states to a classical state. So if I measured, measured zero, then uh, the register is going, now going to be in classical state zero. Uh, but in fact, you can collapse a register without measuring it directly if it's entangled with another register. So for example, let's consider a two qubit state. So the state zero, zero plus one, one. This is a state over two qubits. And these two qubits are related or entangled, or even less formally, you can say that if you see qubit number two, then it leaks information on qubit number one. In such a case, measuring qubit number two will collapse the state of qubit number one as well. So even though I didn't measure uh, qubit number one explicitly, I can uh, collapse its state just by measuring a related qubit. Two properties that we're going to need about uh, quantum registers. So if I have a superposition uh, over states A, then I can create a superposition with the same weights, but on states A comma F of A for, every function, for any function F with the same weights as before. And the last thing is that you can efficiently do Fourier transform on a quantum register if the states come from like a nice abelian groups, which they will. All right, so let's try to see how to use uh, fully homomorphic encryption together with uh, quantum one-time pad uh, to get um, um, quantum fully homomorphic encryption. So I should tell you what is quantum one-time pad. So this was presented by Ambinus et al. And the cool thing is that it allows to encrypt a quantum state using a classical key. So using a, using a, a sequence of classical beats and get perfect security. So in particular, to perfectly encrypt a single qubit, all you need is um, two random classical bits. And, and you can do this. Um, and in terms of notation, we're going to denote alpha sub yz, uh, the quantum one-time pad encryption of the state alpha using, um, using pad keys, uh, using pad bits y and z. So if you're wondering how this is done, so in the quantum one-time pad, you use one of the bits to do exactly the same thing as classical one-time pad. So you use the bit y to do a bit flip um, of, of, uh, of the quantum register that you have. And then you use the bit z to do the dual operation. So you're doing a phase flip. If you don't know what a phase flip is, don't worry about it. We're not really going to uh, mention need it today. But um, importantly, um, note that the classical one-time pad is just a special case of the, um, can be derived as a special case of quantum one-time pad when you take the bit z to be 0. So a classically one-time padded value, classical value, can be seen as a quantumly one-time padded value. So the Brobin Jeffrey approach is the following. So if I want to uh, quantumly encrypt a quantum state, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a quantum one-time pad. So I'm going to generate uh, two classical bits y and z. I'm going to use them to quantum one-time pad the, the, my uh, register alpha. And then I'm going to use a classical encryption scheme uh, to encrypt y and z. And for the sake of my own sanity, instead of writing you know, classical fully homomorphic encryption, uh, classical fully homomorphic encryption of y and z, I'm just going to use brackets. So things in brackets are encrypted with a classical scheme. So uh, this is a pretty cool idea, even regardless of homomorphism. It shows that you can get uh, a quantum public key encryption uh, from any classical public key encryption scheme. Um, and security is pretty immediate just by, just by a hybrid argument. Um, as usual with homomorphic encryption, the problem is how to, how to get correctness, how to get uh, homomorphic evaluation to work. Um, and as I said, this is sort of always the problem. So we're going to forget about security. Once we got to this point, security is guaranteed. There's no, nothing that I can do from this point and on can harm security. All I need to worry about now is to get the functionalities, to get the correctness. How do you get the correctness? Well, 
it turns out that the following building block is uh, required in order to get uh, homomorphic evaluation for this type of schemes. So you can think about it as an analog for um, homomorphism for linear functions in the classical setting. So I have an encrypted bit x and two, um, uh, and two bits uh, a and b. And what I want is to get an encryption of ax plus b. This is sort of a pretty uh, basic primitive. But its quantum analog is slightly more complicated. Um, so now, again, we have an encrypted classical bit and a superposition uh, over uh, two qubits. And what I want is to get an encryption of ax plus b but now using our uh, sort of new, using our encryption method, so this superposition needs to be encrypted with a quantum one-time pad, and the quantum one-time pad needs to be encrypted with a classical scheme. So if I'm able to perform this type of transformation, given a classically encrypted bit x uh, and a superposition over a and b, then I, I'm, I'm, able, I'm going to be able to get the entire uh, quantum, quantum evaluation that I want. And um, actually, another way to think about it is that this operation, in fact, takes this bit x, which is sort of uh, inside a, um, a ciphertext, and teleports it into the, um, into the quantum superposition. Um, so uh, this is uh, actually an approach that was, was useful uh, in the past. Um, so let's see how to actually do it. So this is kind of complicated, so I'm just going to simplify it a little bit. Um, I'm going to do something that I think is as hard. Um, and I'm just going to take I'm just going to uh, take a classical bit x, and now a superposition just over a single qubit. And what I want is to get sort of the quantum analog of an encryption of a times x. So this is what I'm going to uh, work on from now on. Um, and naively, so if I'm saying that this is the quantum analog of getting an encryption of a times x, well, I know my original x bit was encrypted using a classical fully homomorphic encryption. So I can start from uh, a superposition over the a's and get to a superposition over a comma encryption of a times x. This just follows for the, from, the homo, from the classical homomorphic evaluation. So what I got now is a superposition over classical, uh, over classical uh, homomorphic ciphertext. And this is not what I want. I mean, I'd want to now pull out this classical ciphertext from outside of my superposition, because what I want in the end is that all classical encryptions are outside of the superposition, and I'm only getting a superposition that is one time padded and not like encrypted using classical homomorphic encryption. So maybe the right thing to do is to just sort of measure the register that contains a times x. But this is not, going, this is not good because it's going to collapse uh, the superposition. So the first thing that we could notice is that the value a times x actually depends on a. So once I measure an encryption of a times x, I'm going to collapse the superposition of a, and this is going to destroy the correctness of my, the correctness of my evaluation. However, this is not so hard to fix. Uh, I'm just going to introduce a mediator between a times x and the classically encrypted value, and we're going to see that this is going to solve our problem. So I'm going to introduce a new register, y prime, and this y prime is just in superposition between 0 and 1. And now, instead of computing AX plus, uh, just ax, I'm computing ax plus y prime, and I'm going to call this value y. Now, why do I claim that this uh, solved the problem? And, and what I'm going to try to do is pull y out. This is going to be my new goal. But first, let's see why this is, like, uh, why this is progress. So just by definition, y equals ax plus y prime, which means that equivalently y prime equals ax plus y. So y prime is just the value a times x, one time padded by y. So if we measured uh, the, the encryption of y, then really what we would get is a times x, one time padded with this uh, value y for which we, we, we get the ciphertext for. So this, is, uh, this seems like a, a step in the right direction. So this is really what we're going to do. However, we observe that even though now, if we just uh, measure the value y, this is not going to collapse our superposition uh, from, for the reasons that, that I just explained, um, we're not measuring y itself, but actually we're measuring an encryption of y. We're measuring a whole ciphertext. And the ciphertext might leak about the, about the history, about its... Uh, um, uh, about the way that it was, the way that it was created. So, um, and this actually has to be the case so long as your homomorphic evaluation uh, is a deterministic process. So, um, if, if, we were, if we were to measure y, then we would be okay, but we need to measure this ciphertext of y, and uh, this, this, could create, this could create a problem because the ciphertext itself contains some information about the value a that was used to create it, and this will still collapse our superposition. So this is like sort of the hard problem. Um, any suggestions on, on how this can be fixed? Okay, never mind. Um, so, so circuit privacy seems like a tool that could be useful here because circuit privacy uh, essentially says that the information in the ciphertext should not be much more than uh, just the information that exists in the plaintext. 
So let's uh, sort of uh, talk a little bit more in depth about uh, circuit private classical fully homomorphic encryption. Um, so um, what we have is instead of having a deterministic evaluation process, so remember, now we're talking about the classical setting, uh, our homomorphic evaluation is going to be randomized. So in addition to taking uh, the, encrypted, uh, the, encrypted the encrypted input x and the function f, it, there's also going to be a random tape. And this is going to be a randomized functionality. And the guarantee is that the, out the distribution of the outputs, the outputs y, is going to only depend on the plain text. Uh, on the, the encryption of y is only, depend only depends on y. And this is true even if you know x and even if you know f, even if you know everything except the random tape. So in a sense, <clears throat> The circuit private uh, homomorphic evaluation actually pushes all of this um, uh, ugly information that we don't want into the randomness register. So, so long as you don't see the random, randomness register, you don't get any bad information. Um, so property for um, um, uh, randomized evaluation that is going to matter for us is the uh, conditional distribution of the randomness condition on like all this other information, the input, the output, and the function that was evaluated. So um, I'm going to explain why this is important uh, in, in, in the next slide. But for now, <clears throat> this, uh, let's just uh, think about the definition. So if you know uh, the encryption of x, encryptions of, of y and f, what can you tell me about the randomness r? And uh, the way we interpret Mahadev's uh, construction is that she requires um, a circuit private classical homomorphic encryption scheme where uh, the randomness r is uniquely determined by these values x, y, and, x, y, and f. <coughs> Sorry. Whereas uh, here, we want to work with sort of uh, more efficient or um, um, more elaborate uh, uh, ways to get, uh, to get circuit privacy. Um, and especially, uh, we uh, rely on a, on a scheme by uh, um, Boris et al. From, from crypto 2016. And there, the, this conditional distribution of randomness is much uglier. So it's a Gaussian distribution over a lattice coset that is determined by these uh, x, y, and f. So if you don't know what these uh, lattice cosets are, don't worry about it. We won't need them much. But it's like a much uglier uh, distribution. OK, good. So let's see how to use, um, how to use this uh, um, uh, circuit privacy uh, in order to teleport x into our state. So before, we said that we were going to evaluate ax plus y prime. Now we're just going to do it using a circuit private scheme. So we need, additionally, a randomness, uh, a randomness register. So in addition, in our quantum state, we're going to have a randomness value. And we're going to do, um, and we're going to do a circuit private homomorphic evaluation of this value ax plus y prime. And this actually works. Now, if I do this, then I can actually measure this part of the register and uh, get this um, classical encryption of y. But now, the quantum part, well, it contains a and y prime, which is good. This is what I want. But in addition, it contains this randomness value, which, as I said before, now it contains all this like, sort of bad information that I didn't want the ciphertext y to contain before. So now I need to find a way to sort of get rid or uncompute, as they uh, say in quantum terminology, this, uh, register, uh, this register r in order to avoid the state from collapsing. So if I just measure this r to try to get rid of it, then I would collapse the state just as I, would, just as I did before. So uh, what Mahadev showed was that um, in, the, in the case where R is uh, unique, then you can uh, actually remove it by performing binary Fourier transform uh, on the register R. So it doesn't actually remove it. It just sort of pushes it into the phase in a way that is manageable. But let's not get into that. Uh, so for unique R, you can actually find a solution which is sort of, I, I would say it's combinatorial in, nation, in nature. Whereas what we try to do here is get some sort of an uh, algebraic approach to, to, uh, removing this, uh, um, to removing this randomness register. So um, really, at a super high level, what we try to do is replace the binary Fourier transform with QRE Fourier transform, where Q is this LWE modulus. So all of our elements sort of natively live in uh, Z mod Q. So it's natural to try the, the QRE Fourier transform. It doesn't work immediately, so you need to sort of work hard to, to make it work. And then use these algebraic properties of these lattice cosets um, instead of the uh, uniqueness property that, that was used before in order to show that when you do this Fourier transform, it allows you to sort of push the bad information again into the phase in a manageable way. Um, and this, this involves sort of uh, coming up with, uh, uh, with some additional tools and some analogs, uh, quantum analogs of um, uh, classical tools that were known before. Um, but I'm not going to get into the details. Um, let me. Uh, not summarize, but uh, give you some remaining, uh, some remaining questions from this work, and then maybe tell you something else. So um, 
I think, so the way that, the way that I view things is that uh, what we did here was to sort of show that this, this approach of uh, quantum evaluation uh, actually requires um, uh, this requires circuit privacy, and the question is whether this is inherent. It seems like you know, in the, in the quantum setting, things are so delicate that you have to somehow prevent prevent them from collapsing by something like circuit privacy. But I don't even know how to formally sort of define it so that I can try to prove it. So this is sort of one one interesting question. Um, so the second one is I said that we get a slightly larger modulus Q than, than the classical setting. In fact, we match the classical modulus of the circuit private scheme of, of Bohr's et al. I wouldn't be surprised if you can take it further down and get very close to the classical setting. Um, the issue of uh, correctness error is kind of annoying. So we get like really tiny correctness error, but why can't we get perfect correctness like we do in the classical setting? Um, it's not clear how to do it, uh, but I have an actually a purely classical question that you can think of, and if you can solve it, then I think it would be a good, uh, a, a big first, first step towards solving the quantum issue. So the question is to come up with a semi-honest oblivious transfer scheme that has both perfect correctness and perfect privacy for the sender. So we actually know how to do it based on DDH and other uh, number theoretic uh, assumptions, but I want to get a post-quantum solution. So I want to come up with a post-quantum scheme, uh, uh, oblivious transfer scheme, that has both perfect uh, correctness and uh, perfect sender privacy. Completely classical question, and I think if you solve it, it would be a good step towards uh, perfect correctness here. Um, lastly, there's some uh, ugliness in the construction. So we apply, um, like every quantum gate that we apply requires afterwards a lot of post-processing in order to restore the state. And again, we have this slightly uh, non-standard circular security assumption. And, you know, we don't want to have these. We actually want to get the same, uh, the same uh, efficiency guarantees that we have in the classical setting. So um, I want to tell you, I want to buy, uh, eat into my questions time uh, and tell you a little bit about um, things that are slightly different. So there's been um, pretty interesting developments in this whole area of quantum outsourcing. So the setting where you have a quantum, uh, a quantum server that wants to perform some operation for a weaker, possibly classical, uh, possibly classical client. So we talked about the privacy issue, but uh, some other um, interesting things that are happening. So um, you might want this uh, quantum server to actually convince you that it's really doing a quantum operation. So um, you only have a classical communication, and you're a classical dude, but you want the server to compute to, to convince you that it's actually performing a quantum, quantum operation. This is related to the so-called quantum supremacy uh, um, pro uh, problem that's, uh, that uh, practitioners also care about. Um, other thing that you, can, that you can want a quantum party to do is to provide you with pure randomness. This is sort of the only way in the universe that we know to get pure randomness is to use quantum, um, uh, is to use quantum processes. And me, as a classical person, want a proof that indeed my uh, server produces produce randomness in a proper quantum way. Last thing that you may want is the delegation problem. Um, so you want the, the uh, server to, to solve a quantum problem for you, and you want to be able to sort of verify that the solution is correct, even though you're just a classical, you're just a classical person. Um, so the first two issues uh, were addressed in work by Christi uh, with uh, Cristiano, Mahadev, uh, Vazirani, and Vidic. And um, this last point uh, was addressed by a recent work of uh, Mahadev. Uh, so both of these are going to appear in Fox, uh, in the upcoming Fox. Um, and all of these, like these two works and uh, Mahadev's original quantum FHE are actually related. And let me sort of try to give you a super high level intuition that connects uh, these three problems uh, to the quantum homomorphism uh, problem that we, uh, um, that we saw. So the verifier can use a quantum, sort of a quantum, uh, a fully homomorphic encryption. He generates classical keys and encrypts the classical message zero, and he sends those to the, um, and he sends those to the server. Now the server um, does quantum homomorphic evaluation of a designated uh, quantum function according to this uh, specific task that we want the server to perform. So there's some designated quantum function that the server needs to apply, and then he sends back the classical part of the result. And what you want to argue is that the verifier who has the secret key now uh, knows why, and also the randomness uh, that was used to encrypt why. And this, uh, you need to work hard to, to argue that this sort of straddles uh, the, the prover in some meaningful way that allows you to get soundness for these, uh, for these sort of tasks. So this is super high level connection, um, also not chronological connection between these, uh, between these two things. Um, and I think there's some pretty cool progress and uh, some, some interesting problems that uh, lie ahead. Um, thank you.